Wondering what life is really like on Canada's wild and crazy West Coast? This podcast is all about the people, the places, and Vancouver Island time. Together, we'll explore this island paradise, a combination of ocean, city, and country living. We'll meet the fabulous locals, such as the Fudge Fairy and the Chicken Lady, who have chosen Victoria and Vancouver Island as their home. And we'll learn what makes this place unique and special to those who live here. And now, your host of Vancouver Island Time, Jane Johnston. Hi, everybody. It's Jane Johnston, and welcome to the neighborhood of Royal Oak. This neighborhood is uh, just northwest of the city, so straight up the island highway as you move from downtown to the ferries. It was established in 1911. And uh, what's cool about it is that it's very central. And Carol's going to talk to us about why she has chosen Royal Oak to live in of the three areas that she's lived in previously, which were James Bay, Oak Bay, and now Royal Oak. So, Carol, uh, tell us about Royal Oak. Royal Oak is fabulous. It's like being in the country while you're in the heart of the city. You can get downtown in five to seven minutes, even when there's traffic. But we are also like five minutes from walking to Beaver, Beaver Lake, uh, around the trail, 10-mile trail around Elk Lake. Fabulous place to live if you like nature. There are um, wonderful wildlife birds to watch in this area. Uh, it's very quiet. Although it's close to the highway, you can't hear a thing. And you're, be, you're beside what was formerly a golf course as well. Do you know if there's anything happening with that? The golf course is for sale. It's further back from where I live. So I think this little um, sort of putting grass between us and the next development will remain. There's a bit of a pond there where the geese come and frogs sing madly starting on Valentine's Day. So I think that will stay. Cool. So um, what drew you to this area of the city from Oak Bay specifically, actually? Because Oak Bay is pretty co- it's a pretty coveted area in uh, Greater Victoria. And Royal Oak is kind of up and coming, really. I had a fabulous home in, in Oak Bay, but I just found the yard and the older uh, structure too hard to maintain by myself because I live alone. So I decided I needed to move into a condo or a townhouse where the outside work was taken care of for me. And um, I, that's why I really like this place. Oak Bay was fabulous because you could walk. I was w- within walking distance of, uh, of the beach and uh, I could hear the surf when the storms came up. Uh, and your neighbor across the street singing opera and my neighbor singing opera and her son playing piano Uh, yeah it it was really a friendly neighborhood uh, part of an old orchard uh, maybe a hundred years ago the tree in my backyard was a hundred years old the the apple tree Um, I really enjoyed living there but it was just too much work for me to look after so you're in what we call a strata. So a strata is a series of townhomes. So I came here for lunch a few weeks ago, actually, and I met one of your neighbors who was really lovely. And I'm just wondering, um, what do you think about living in a strata? Well, I'm getting used to it. Um, it seems a little crowded for a girl from the Yukon. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I have fabulous views from here. I can see almost, well, I can see to the ocean. I can see the mountains, the Olympic Mountains from here. And uh, so the spaciousness of the grounds and the beauty of the, of the grounds really makes up for the closeness of, uh, of people who live here. Everyone minds their business immaculately, too. It's really quite lovely. Um, it's not, even though they're very close, they're very um, respectful of privacy here. And you have the advantage of having quite a large place as well. So you have like a large master bedroom. You didn't have to give up on space at all. Plus you have a large storage area in the in the basement. So for people who want to to move out of a house it's a great option for them because then they are able to have a 
uh, maintain their style of living, have everything on the outside taken care of, and they can go away. It's not a gated community, but you're at a, the end of a cul-de-sac as well. So um, do you ever walk through the trails around here? Oh, yeah. The trails lead everywhere. There are places to walk your dogs, places to swim your dogs, uh, places for horses even. Sometimes when we're on the trail, I can smell horses have just passed. So uh, yeah, it's fabulous and a real diversity of animal life and people life around here. Yeah. Um, what about for shopping? So you're close to Broadmead Shopping Centre and Royal Oak Shopping Centre. So tell us about them, which, which one do you prefer? And um, you're also really close to the Commonwealth uh, uh, Community Centre where they have an Olympic sized pool and diving board and library fabulous library bruce hutchison branch of the uh the library downtown i can go online get books sent there from the main branch uh and i've done that there's this beautiful swimming pool and all kinds of courses you know yoga and fitness pilates that you can take there which i don't do but i should um i like the outdoors better so i don't do that okay and what about for shopping and stuff well thrift I'll tell you, the country grocer is my go-to place. Uh, Things are really uh, well-priced there, and there's a good supply. But for real specialty items, I like to go to thrifties for the ganache cakes and uh, just the lovely little sandwiches that they make and treats and certain things that uh, the country grocer doesn't have. I feel like I have a lot of choice and a lot of places to go when I go shopping here. Yeah, plus there are some good restaurants there. There's the Cafe Mexico. Have you been to that? No, I haven't. Okay, well, that's in Broadmead. And then there's another um, a restaurant right across. This, uh, there's Romeo's. The Bistro, that's the best. It's a wonderful place. Have a glass of wine, really nice soups for lunch. I often meet friends there. Yeah, and they also have uh, the Heritage. I can't remember the name of that linen store. It just sounds expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Love that place. They have their for sale stuff out on the sidewalk every day. Really friendly inside too. Good place to shop. Yeah. So we're really only about five minutes away from the ocean. And then we're literally on the trails. Um, What about things like when you were moving down here? So you moved down here from uh, Whitehorse. Uh, my husband drove her truck down with my son. That was quite an adventure. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to take that road by myself. So uh, Jane's husband and son uh, flew up there and then jumped in my uh, RAV4 and drove it down the highway. I was so happy to see everybody had arrived intact. It was lovely. Although I did, they did show up with some um, cans with holes in them, which, and I found out later, <laughs> they were practicing shooting from the side of the road. <laughs> well, that's what guys do up there. This completely a man's territory. They always say it's uh, the north where men are men and women are men too. Now you know why I wanted to introduce her, because she's so funny. Okay, so what about in terms of finding, um, like, medical care? Do you have a dentist and doctor nearby? Was it hard when you moved to Victoria? Somebody asked me that question, and I know for myself, I was really, uh, like, on top of getting a doctor for our family. But, you know, have you had any trouble with that? You know, it took me about two years to to find a doctor who would take me, because they do tend to... um, have a lot of uh, clients and they stay with their same clients. But there seems to be uh, enough of a turnover that if you just are persistent enough, I just put my name online and waited for someone to come up. So I have a doctor now uh, and I like to have my appointments, my beauty appointments and my what I call body maintenance, you know, pedicures and massages and stuff like that. I like to have those nearby, dog grooming. So it took me about maybe six months, eight months to, you know, reestablish all of those kind of services right in this area where I can get to it in five minutes. Yeah, I found the same thing when I lived in Toronto and I moved from North Toronto to the beaches. It was, it was the same thing. I just like, it was like, you're, you're not only in a, you are literally in a different city, but um, also, you know, it's easy to buy local and to work with local people. I find that too with, with uh, 
all sorts of different medical care. Although I don't, I haven't gotten a, a pedicure or a manicure lately. I'll have to work on that. <laughs> Um, okay. And what about the demographics of this area? How do you find it for you? Um, like, uh, obviously I think a lot of people in this particular townhouse complex are mature, but what about in the neighborhood in general? What do you find? Well, there are lots of retired people in the area because we're right across from Berwick house and you often see them walking their dogs and just getting fresh air. Uh, the people in this complex are tend to be older too and they were in despair when they saw that I was uh, you know older than 65 we need young people they said but I don't know why because uh, we all do for each other and manage things quite well yeah I found um, the rec center there's a rec center there's also Royal Oak Middle School which is nearby and then across the highway is Claremont Secondary School so uh, both have great reputations and if you're into rowing they actually both have rowing programs as well it's my daughter rows against them I know that um, Claremont has a sport institute as well and then we're actually not that far away from uh, UVic right UVic is 15 minutes away. I often go to the Farker Center for the symphony and uh, take classes at university for uh, us old white-haired types who want to still keep learning. And uh, so it's very easy jaunt straight down Royal Oak Avenue, straight to UVic. Yeah, when I rode at UVic, actually, we used to come up there and uh, having moved from Toronto and driving through old uh, forests to come up just 15 minutes away to a lake was just amazing to me. Do you ever go up to Mount Doug? You know, I haven't explored that area too much. I like flat surfaces to walk on, so I haven't. The mountains, I, I had my fill of mountains in the Yukon, walking up, walking down. Now I just want to walk flat. <laughs> She's a flatlander. <laughs> I found, uh, like, uh, when I bring a guest, though, I take them up to Mount Doug because uh, they're actually, I think, I don't know if there still are, but there were whale watching uh, tour guides who stand up there and they look for the plumes of the whales as they go around. That's how they direct the boats. So um, what else is fun to see and do around here? Anything you can? Oh, the observatory on West Saanich Road is five minutes away and uh, in the summertime they have programs you, if you're there after 11 at night when it gets really dark you can look through any number of telescopes at uranus saturn uh, the moon it's fabulous so i i do that in the summertime uh, butch art gardens is also very close um, and they have uh, musical programs in the summer as well as fabulous grounds to wander you, you're i can take my dog there and uh I have a, a year's membership, so for $50, I can go numerous times during the year. And they have special shows in the summer, too. They have um, fireworks and stuff like that as well. Yeah, fireworks. Um, sometimes some rock and roll and local bands show up, and the symphony plays there. They actually assemble and play right there in the apple orchard. It's wonderful. Huh, I'm going to have to do that with my family. Okay, so I think we've covered Royal Oak. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me, Jane Johnston at the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun. We're going to come back and just talk to Carol about all of her passion, which is, I, as you can guess, symphony is one of them. <laughs> and the other is art. And we'll see what she's been doing in her house. It's really exciting. Okay, talk to you soon. Vancouver Island Time is brought to you by the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun Victoria, where we bring local expertise and global presence to your property. <laughs> okay, Carol and I got to know each other. I'm back here with Carol Pettigrew, and we got to know each other about five or six years ago when I was referred to you by Claire Fluelling, who's now Claire Wyatt, when I worked at Pemberton Homes. Yeah. Yeah, I've known Claire since she was a baby. And uh, Claire, um, anyway, so she introduced us, thought we were a good fit. And uh, so you're kind of like an auntie to me, I think. Oh, that's so nice of you to say. Well, you when you when you work in this type of uh, industry, you get involved in people's lives. So 
anyway, so thank you for welcoming me into your life. Okay, so tell, uh, one of the things I wanted you to understand, we're actually supposed to sit up here, <laughs> is uh, what Carol does. So she is really a true artist, uh, like from the heart. So what is it that you have in your left hand there? Uh, it's a quilt I made in the Yukon based on a Amish design, uh, which is just a diamond in a square. And uh, I used fabrics that were brightly colored, unlike the Amish, who tend to work mostly in blacks and neutrals. And uh, from there, it just got better and better. You can see my dog loves them too. <laughs> She's like a cat. They, the cat will always find a quilt, no matter where it's at. So how many how many quilts, how did you get into quilting? And how many quilts have you done over the course of your professional quilting life? Oh my gosh, my husband went into um, politics after uh, he sold his businesses in 1992. And uh, he promptly, you know, never, he hardly ever came home after that. He was busy. Uh, before I knew it, he was uh, uh, working as a full-time premier of the Yukon. So I had nothing to do, so I went quilting. I took some courses in the States and uh, set up a studio at home and uh, took care of of that for probably five or six years before I even looked up for my work. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't know your husband was the ex-premier of uh, the Yukon. Yeah, he, he did one term uh, in uh, government and one term in opposition before they... Uh, threw him out of threw him out before he didn't get reelected. <laughs> There's something like uh, politicians never die; they just don't get reelected or something. That's right. So tell us about the second quilt here. Oh well, after I got over my brights, my era of bright colors, I decided to go with neutrals. Well, the themes of this quilt um, are Japanese, and they're based on Japanese handwoven fabrics that are worn typically uh, for everyday use by people who work in the fields or around the house. The colors are neutrals and uh, gray, gray tones, which uh, the Japanese love traditionally. And the quilting in the background is of uh, plants that uh, spring up in the spring. Up here you can see um, a koi and at the bottom, there's a rabbit in the moon, one of my favorites. So the actual quilt lines um, depict Japanese themes as well as the fabrics um, so being sort of reminiscent of, uh, of Japanese traditional fabrics. The border I've done in a, a velvet, a cream colored velvet, which makes it feel really nice like a little baby blankie. I actually made this for me. It's the only quilt I've ever done just specifically for me, to my taste and with um, images and colors that I love. And then lately I've come back to the bright, my brights again, and I've inspired by my, t my uh, summer nights up at the observatory. It's made with that fabulous nebula fabric that uh, has been printed from photographs taken by NASA of outer space. And uh, I made it for a friend, actually the friend who did the painting here. And he's a great coffee lover and a carpenter and a golfer. So I put fabrics that relate to that. Here's his carpentry tools. And, uh, oh, he loves to fish, so there's the ocean. He loves history, so there's a little bit of um, um, Egyptian frieze. And there's some golf balls and a coffee cup. Very cool. So it's kind of personalizes it. So are these all are these all thematic based? Your Usually when you're when I'm making them I have somebody in mind. So yeah, I think about what might go on the back and what kind of patterns and colors I should use depending on the personality of the person. So um, two stories about quilts. The first one is just about the colors that you're using. My mom said to me when I was younger, I painted a room really bright colors, similar to what you're putting in your quilts. And she said to me, you must be a very happy person. <laughs> so I always remembered that. And when I look at the colors that you've surrounded yourself all throughout your house, the paintings behind you, the wall, the, the colors that you've um, incorporated, I think same thing that you must be a very happy person. And um, the second thing I wanted to just share with you is I had a quilt made for me for my kids when they were born and 
and um, they were thematic in nature too. And I just never knew how much uh, intricacy there was in in quilts and just so tell us tell us a bit about this last quilt that we're we're looking at here this was one of my earliest quilts and it was uh it's a very basic design using large pieces and it's based on amish design this one is called diamond in a square um, the colors are completely un amish though the amish would probably do them in blacks browns and maybe uh grade colors but uh, I decided to use uh, very bright colors just to kind of break with tradition. Um, I think as I get older, some of these large, simple patterns appeal to me more and more. And I'm more concerned with doing large splashes of color and dramatic effect than I am with detail now. Cool. All right. And then, um, so I don't know if you can see behind us, but you have very bright walls. And then across, uh, you can see in the mirror behind us, you have this big picture. And when I was here last time, you explained to me about the picture. So first of all, tell me about the color that we have here on the walls and the the picture that you have over there, because I, I think that's special. One thing you'll see about Carol is there are themes that run through her life. So. Well, color has always been a big part of my life. And uh, with this place, when I had it painted, I had an opportunity to do exactly as I pleased. So I did the beautiful turquoise behind me, the dining room in a similar, this is blue green, I call it blue green. The dining room is green blue and, uh, and I have a fuchsia in the sitting room where there's lots of light. Uh, the mural across the wall from me is of a it's a giant photographic blow up of um, what they call the pasque flower in Yukon it's like a wild crocus and it's the seed head so it will look to you probably like a dandelion head and are those um like what time of the year do those come out exactly on June 10th because I used to sun print them and I'd mark it on my calendar pasque flower in uh, seed June 10th What's, what do you mean by sun print? Oh, well, a sun print, I found by um, just sheer accident, a dye made in France that if you put it on wet fabric and then put plants on top of the fabric, the molecules of dye are sun seeking and they will travel out from under the leaves and stems and into the background. So what you're left with when the fabric dries is an imprint of the plant. That is so cool. Okay, well, let's look at, um, it's almost Easter here. So let's look at what Carol's doing with her Easter eggs. It's so exciting. <laughs> okay, so the last thing we're going to focus on are the Easter eggs that Carol does. So she has uh, started on them. She's working on them with her sister. And she's just going to explain the history behind the Easter egg for her and her family. And then um, show us what she's been doing. So uh, tell us, Carol, what's going on here? Well, I do this every Easter. Uh, every Easter, um, I get out my grandmother's tools, the, the kiskas, which can, you know, are little containers, uh, little scribes that you fill with uh, wax uh, that's mixed with soot. And you apply the wax to eggs in a style like batik, where uh, whatever is covered by the wax acts as a resist. So that's how you get the many colors of the Easter eggs, by applying layer after layer of wax over dye after dye bath. These are my grandmother's Easter eggs. Uh, this one from 1982. Uh, it's a goose egg, and my grandfather has put it in a little um, box to be hung on the wall. I haven't hung it because um, this one I did hang, and you can tell that it's faded considerably from the sun. But, uh, but the pattern is still there. My, my baba used to put things away after Christmas and get, get her kiska and her wax. She used a kerosene lantern at the time and get her dyes out. These dyes are all, you know, done in sealing jars and then um, kept over day after day. She would do this for months. I only do it for a week or two every spring and I invite my friends to come and enjoy them. These are eggs that we've done in the past my daughter and my granddaughter and my friends and I. That's a goose egg. This one is from a part of Ukraine that uh, I'm not familiar with, but 
but I love the patterns. It's a duck egg. And, uh, and then there are hen's eggs that are done with various uh, different motifs. Uh, each of these is a symbol. The diamond for prosperity, the network of nets in between for plenty of food. There's uh, pussy willows here representing spring and rebirth. Um, if you're giving an egg to an old person, you want to do dark colors and you want to have um, ladders on it because they're due to be ascending to higher realms soon. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which Christianity is represented by the cross, of course. Those, that's a relatively new um, take on Easter eggs. This is so ancient, it predates Christianity, this particular f art form. My grandmother learned it from an old woman in her village in the old country. She taught my mother, my mother taught me, and I taught my daughter and my granddaughter. So this is what we're doing. It, we get kind of silly these days, too. This one is going to be a minion for a young person. This one's going to be for someone who loves Star Wars. So, you know, I think anything goes. I love tradition, but I also like to break tradition, too. So and what about these ones? Here? These are basic ones that we just do a little practice on before we get down to work. This is called a Krushenka, an Easter egg with just dots on it. It's a good way to get your Kiska skills up to par and uh, just fill the Easter basket with some plain ones just for relief from some of the patterns. Children work with boiled eggs and adults with, um, with uh, raw eggs. And it's not uncommon to work two or three days on, an, on a raw egg and then drop it accidentally while you're removing the wax or uh, breaking it when you, when you go to blow the yolk and the white out of the egg. It's quite common. So you need to do all the work before you blow it. And sometimes when you blow it, you blow it. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's something that um, young people have, uh, uh, I think it's really good for them to practice because there's no instant gratification with this process. It takes days to actually see what you've done and to get the reward for all your hard work. And uh, it's, you know, rife with detail and lots of patience required. And it's a huge triumph when the eggs are done and everyone sits down to compare and admire them. It's a wonderful feeling. Thank you, Carol, for such a warm welcome to Royal Oak. Isn't she an amazing person? I'd also like to thank you for listening to our podcast at Vancouver Island Time. If you want to see Carol's beautiful art, please watch our vlog on Facebook or YouTube. Coming up in our next podcast are Lori Frank in the Highlands and Charmaine the Fudge Fairy in Machosen. If you want more information about these areas, please contact me at Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosun. Take care and have a great day. Welcome to the neighborhood. We hope you have had some insight into West Coast living. If you know of someone or some place that should be highlighted in our podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Please go to VancouverIslandTime.com and click on our Connect button. See you next week on Vancouver Island Time with Jane Johnston. Do you feel like you're drowning in administrivia? Do you have a podcast you would like transcribed to repurpose as a blog or even a best-selling book? Rhonda's virtual office is the answer to the freedom you crave so you can get busy doing what you love. Let Rhonda's virtual office give you the relief you need. Visit rondasvirtualoffice.com and get some peace of mind today. Rhonda's virtual office is the go-to transcription service for EWN Podcast Network.